Yeah, well, excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Thanks for showing up. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah, excited to have gotten to know Charlie, um, James, the guys, Mana, uh, over the last year or so. Um, my work with Mark, I think there's a lot of like overlap, so it's just kind of really fun that we get to do this together. Um, but I'll start with an intro for me. Um, and uh, <clears throat> what Charlie didn't tell you is he, he just, all he did was give me the like word sustainability as kind of what I get to focus on. So I said, hey, that's great because I'm actually doing a doctorate of ministry right now um, at United Theological Seminary that's out in Dayton, Ohio with Mark Mosaics. They have a house of study that's there. And uh, I just last week finished my uh, research. So I've got some like really fresh <laughs> data or like insights that I want to share with you guys. So you guys get to hear this new insight I have um, that I've just gotten from this case studies uh, research I'm doing. And I'll share more about that later. But um, anyway, so the focus of the case studies I'm looking at is sustainability, long-term sustainability. So uh, this is good. Anyway, I'm Dan, uh, church planter, uh, social entrepreneur. So I've started a church, uh, started a social enterprise uh, cafe, uh, work with Mark um, and with Mosaics, Global Network. Um, <clears throat> and let's see, I, um, I'll share more a little bit about the backstory, but... Um, my uh, MDiv is from Duke, and then I am now, right now, at United Theological Seminary for the Demon. Um, <clears throat> what I wanted to share next was just context for where I'm coming from and why I started thinking about that question of long-term sustainability, uh, where that came from for me. So, a uh, former church planter, I moved to Pasadena uh, end of 2000, no, 2009, end of 2009, and uh, by 2011, I re did a church restart. So this is a church in Pasadena. Um, it's a free Methodist uh, denomination, small Methodist denomination. And uh, it was the very first one that had started in Southern California. Originally started in 1888. Uh, it lasted until uh, 2008, yep, so 120 years. And then the church had aged out, declined, and the denomination closed it. So I think a very typical story uh, for denominational churches. And uh, so then I came in young, naive, and went <laughs> to go into church planting and reopened the church um, in 2011. Um, very typical neighborhood church, right? On the corner of a neighborhood, a uh, small footprint. Um, I think we had like maybe 150 chairs. So, you know, for us, when we had 100 on a Sunday, we were happy. Um, and then Easter, we would obviously, you know, pack it out, and that was our best, you know, Sunday. So, but small congregation, neighborhood congregation, uh, focus on, you know, blended worship, you know, so we were looking at, like, how do we integrate some, like, you know, timeless practices, um, family-oriented. My, my wife and I uh, had just gotten married. Uh, our son by then was maybe a year old, so we were just getting our family going, and, um, yeah, we were excited to get uh, this church happening. And then, um, you know, for me, I, you know, just get in, going for it, uh, find myself doing as much innovation as I can, very uh, progressive, mission-driven. Um, but I remember when I was getting this going that the question I kept asking myself is, wow, if this church lasted 120 years, that's, that's a good amount of time. That's a good couple of generations. What does it look like to repeat that, right? To keep, to do that story again is really the question. So I was thinking constantly about how do I sustain this ministry over the long haul? Like how can I put in some, um, uh, you know, put in some systems and structures that are going to outlast me, right? That was kind of the big question. How does this sustain generationally? That was the big question. Along the way though, as I got that church going and we're up and running, um, then I started working on a side project. This is a ministry. This might be one of the MANA projects, uh, one of those innovative projects that's happening within the life of, you know, that, of the community. For me, it ends up being coffee. Um, so some of the first neighbors I met while I was out there and uh, trying to serve the neighborhood were actually youth, uh, unfortunately, sleeping in the church parking lot. So they were experiencing homelessness. The church that I pastored was uh, very close to our city college, passing the city college. So during the day, the youth went to the college and some were students or they just used the amenities, blended in, you know, found their kind of community. And then after that, they would come to the church 
uh, and sleep in the parking lot. And I obviously, as a young pastor, wanted to help, so did the usual, hey, here's some food, here's some clothing, here's a safe space. Um, and that lasted for probably about nine months um, before, oh, you know, um, a lot of bad things started happening. <laughs> you know, the little tent city popped up, the drugs, the drinking, and it kind of got out of control really fast. So the neighbors in Pasadena weren't happy with about that. So I quickly had to pivot and find another solution. Uh, thankfully, I was able to help the youth there um, find some local nonprofits that they were able to actually get real help in a sense, right? They were able to get housing and they got case management and they got mental health services, education services, you know, these larger nonprofits, well-established to be able to take care of. But I was still left wondering, hey, what can I do? You know, what, what role can we as a local church play? And uh, so in getting the church restarted, I'm left with this coffee cart. Uh, yeah, that one over in the top right. Uh, so we decided to repurpose that and go back to the nonprofits that I had helped the youth land in and say, hey, um, do you have any youth that are actually ready to transition out of your programs and start working um, and learn how to be baristas? Uh, we love to help them get jobs. And so we started training the youth inside the church on that uh, coffee cart. Um, and uh, along the way, eventually we built a smaller one, um, the, this other one here, that went out and started doing events. And then we started to learn how to like generate income off of that and um, you know, figure out how to start building slowly a business. Um, but again, that same question as that was getting started um, came up to me, which is like, wow, I've got the church. What's the generational long-term sustainability look like? But now I have this program and I started asking the same question. What's it look like to turn this program into something that's sustainable um, and long-term? And uh, so I kept thinking through this question um, again and again. So uh, that eventually led to the studies that I want to share and the insights and all that. But I um, want to pause and just ask you guys and get that conversation going about what does sustainable ministry mean to you? Um, have you guys started thinking about that as well? Um, and if so, like what comes to mind for a long-term sustainable ministry? I know we can easily get into projects and we can do something quick and innovative and it's impactful and it's awesome. But then at the other side, there's these questions about like, well, how do we sustain this? You know, um, for me, I wanted to be able to step out of the church and let it keep going for another, I was there almost 10 years. So another 110 years, you know, so those were the things I was processing. But um, yeah, I'd love to hear from you guys. Um, when you hear of sustainable ministry, long-term generational ministry, what do you think of? What comes to your mind? Eric. Uh, a handful of things. Yeah. I'll just rattle them off. Please. Systems, rhythms, culture, building, mission, vision, values, nonprofit considerations that generate revenue to fund generational vision, like kingdom vision. Yeah. And then so the last one I'll just say is leadership development, intentional. Mm, that's good. Next gen leadership development. Yeah, that's good. Um, so you're, you're, you're thinking deeply about this already. <laughs> I think Eric needs to also jump in on a demon. Hey, we've got some room at United if you want to join us. <laughs> um, great. That's an awesome list of, you know, really some insightful things. Who else? Anything else you're thinking about? Sustainable long-term ministry. Yeah. I would say legacy is uh, the passing on. The passing on piece. Yeah. yeah. The passing on the values yeah. of, you know, yeah. building a, on a strong foundation. Yeah. You know, and not just building That's right. And I think that's what, you know, Eric's saying too with the, the importance of those systems, right? Because they're in play, but then the next generation needs to be able to take them on and, and move with them. Yeah, that's good. Uh, what else? Makes yeah. Let me think of a couple things. Um, makes me think about how to uh, judge success. Like, it's mm. that as we're going, um, it's not really that successful until other people are doing it also. Ah, uh, interesting. And starting yeah. to lead. Um, yeah. So even as looking at metrics, yeah. like sometimes we can do a lot, like you said, projects or mm -hmm. have a big impact in like a year or something. Mm -hmm. But then if, if the, the main leader or a few of the leaders step out or gone, does it continue? Well, does it continue? Yeah. And yeah. is it going to grow? Yeah. You know? So that's right. I'm um, trying to have a, have That's a way good. To, 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 to see is yeah. that, 
um, DNA yeah. growing inside of people. And are, is anyone here like using more long-term metrics like that to measure success? Anyone thinking about in those terms already? Because I think that's a good point. But like, if we don't build it into our metrics, yeah. we're not going to pay attention. I think it's the only metric I have. Because mm. honestly, you know, a lot of church yeah. planting causes burnout. And yeah. the reason it causes burnout is because you're trying to create a show. You're trying to create something that looks great right now. Yeah. But it's not sustainable. And if it's also kind of like, you know, personality driven, then you don't have much after the personality is gone. And there's a lot of reasons for that could happen. Yeah. That's good. Well, I was just told that maybe it's a good resource for everybody. It's called a discipleship toolkit. And so it's used, it's contextualized, so it's used, but oh, that's you good. can really extract those principles and questions. And then according to the age, you can yeah. apply that. So. Yeah. That's good. How about on the business side? You guys run in businesses. Like, how do you think long term on the business side? I appreciate what. It's been shared too, I think, also trying to create systems that are lightweight and low maintenance. Okay. So when you talk about passing things on to the next generation, who are already here, right? So trying to, to think through so what does that look like to, pa to pass on to someone else? So, yeah. Um, you share yours too. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about um, local discipleship. Um, in the case of Compton, let's say, you gotta be there by calling. Not okay. A, not many people probably will just go and say, okay, we're gonna take over. Um, but if you raise local disciples, mm -hmm. um, which people are really proud um, in the city of Compton, uh, proud to be uh, from Compton. So if you you develop those disciples, uh, I think that, that that will guarantee a lot of work. Yeah, that's good. So um, kind of like just going back to my story real quick, after I got the churches up running, got the ministry for the coffee training in the church as a program running, and I'm thinking about sustainable ministry, I realized along the way that like, okay, if I want to sustain now this little project, this little innovative thing that we're doing, we would have to uh, decide and figure out a way to grow it and create the systems that it could sustain itself. Right. Again, that's be, me being able to walk out and someone else can run it. So with that, we then set our sights on a brick and mortar space uh, to move the program into a local cafe. And so uh, then 2017, um, we opened Rosebud, um, our coffee, um, a coffee shop. And uh, from then, it's just been a matter of continuing figuring out the systems <laughs> that are going to be able to you know, sustain itself. Uh, thankfully, um, you know, we were able to get a lot of support, obviously, from the community because as a church, that's one thing. You have that social capital, that social network. People show up. They want to hear what's going on. Then you have an awesome product to bring them back, though, right? Because they're not going to come back again after the story. <laughs> They'll come back the second time for the product. Um, and then from there, we were able to, uh, at the cafe, get to break even. Yeah, that's awesome. But we're like, if we really want to get, you know, sustainable ministry or business out of this, we got to break, make some profit. We got to make some money. So then obviously it got really hard with COVID and we then began to bounce out of that um, after bringing in the microbrewery to share the space, to share our costs so that now our rent is split in half. Uh, that brings our overhead down um, and then building the right team to, you know, uh, build a better product and get the coffee going. Along the way, though, we also got a grant um, to bring in a coffee roaster. That was another way to bring our costs down. Um, so I didn't have to pay uh, roasted bean prices. I could buy green beans, uh, get our own recipe, something we're even more excited about. Um, and then from there, be able to also scale through wholesale. Uh, so if you have a church looking to uh, buy some coffee, um, you can go on our website and wholesale it. Um, but, you know, that was kind of part of where we had to start thinking through, again, long term. It's not going to work if we just kind of, you know, have our heads down and are just kind of working day to day. But <clears throat> what are these long term plans we can make to make this sustainable? Um, and I wanted to focus then as I get towards um, my studies and talk about what insights I've had, I wanted to kind of uh, go back to um, 
why I jumped in with Mark and this whole church economics, because I'm asking myself these questions about getting the cafe running long term. Uh, and I feel like I'm probably the only one out there doing this, or at least that's what it felt like. <laughs> um, and then right before the pandemic in March 2020, um, I had connected with Mark DeMoz. He had written this book called Tr The Coming Revolution of Church Economics. I'm like, oh, thank goodness I'm not alone. Other people are thinking this. Other people are trying this. Uh, what's going on? So I got a hold of Mark. Mark came out to my little neighborhood church. Uh, we pulled together a group of pastors like this. Uh, and we started, you know, just asking him about, uh, you know, this, this church economics revolution that he had written about and had some time with him to kind of think through it. Um, and <clears throat> one of the reasons, too, like I felt like, OK, with the coffee business, why I had to figure this out is because of the experience we were having in the local neighborhood church, which his book points to. And that was it's getting harder and harder every year to grow, let's say, and sustain that model of church. And so Mark, in his book, had written these um, and done some research of his own to say these economic shifts that are taking place are what are making it so hard for neighborhood style sized churches like mine. Right. So I'm not speaking of like mega church, different world, different story. But maybe you're in a neighborhood church kind of like mine. This is what you're experiencing. This is what you're feeling. Some of those things are uh, a growing burden on the middle class because the middle class wealth is now at its lowest point since 1941. Um, there is now also the rise of dual income households, right? That's normative in U.S. households. Uh, if you're married, does your spouse work? Is that majority? M mine does. My wife's a teacher. She's full time. So I think that's something we're experiencing. And then the shift in generational approaches towards giving. So those born before 1964 equals almost 80% of total church giving. Okay, yep. So those bo born before 1964 are responsible right now for almost 80% of the total church giving, right? So you've got a rapidly changing or shift in the general, general generational approaches to giving. Another like side note, Mark um, did a study. He was working at a church as a fractional leader for the church. And he did a study. He shared that at the MANA group that we had, right? Which is he looked at the deep dive into like, if we were to replace one of these older tithing units with a younger person, it's going to, in that church, it's going to take seven younger tithing units to replace one older tithing unit. Now think about that <laughs> as far as your systems and structures, because they would have to completely change to accommodate uh, a sevenfold um, multiplication. Uh, that's a big change that's coming, right? So that's another reason we're feeling this need to like figure things out. Um, I would also say he had written too about the rapidly changing population, the demographics, uh, the wealth gaps, income disparity between people groups. A lot of research you can see and read on that. Um, and then, of course, declining church uh, attendance and budget. So uh, from 1999 to 2019, um, attendance and budgets are down 29%. And then from 2009 to 2014, down another 17%. And COVID didn't help us, <laughs> right? COVID did not help us at all. Yeah, one of the churches I went to research um, doing this awesome project that I'll share about here in a minute, uh, they did not bounce back. Um, I think they probably were up to like three to 400, and now they're down to like less than 200 for their size church and uh, COVID was the main main thing for them. So I think we're up against something. Um, I think it is, Mark's right, it's time for us to rethink um, church economics, time to rethink how we're sustaining our ministry, uh, you know, need to come up with a, a new solution. So, but I'll pause there and yeah, does this ring true? When did this book come out? Uh, 2019. 2019, 2019 yeah. So yeah, 2019 and then I, I met him in 2020. It was crazy, yeah. It was that, it was in March, and it was just like a group like this, and all of a sudden at the same time our phones started ringing and buzzing because we were all getting notified that Sunday was canceled because you couldn't have an in-person gathering um, from the, because of local government regulations. So all of us were like, what the heck is happening right now? I was like, very, very uh, timely and prophetic. But yeah, I don't know, is this, what, is this true for you? Um, this is what Mark researched, what and I, I experienced in my neighborhood church, but... What about you? Um, how does this feel? 
Any responses? I think particularly the shift in generational approaches towards giving. Okay. About 90% of our church is under 30. Wow. And so we look at the monthly giving and we talk about first fruits giving. Yeah. You know, our principle for living generously. <laughs> we say we take everything, give 10%. Yeah. But start somewhere, give a percentage. And the number of people to give 40, you know, they're working professionals. Yeah. In their 20s, okay. Three years out of college, making six figures. Wow. And yet, they're very willing to meet other needs. Interesting. And okay. So when it's vague and stewardship minded, just saying, hey, God's entrusted this to you. How much yeah. you give to the household of God? Yeah. And then we, we bring up our foster ministry. Okay. The needs that they have, it's like overflow. Wow. And so they're very motivated by needs, not disciplined, you know, the spiritual discipline of being a steward in that way. Very interesting. So it's, it sounds like the, the habit, the practice has shifted. Not to say, like, be careful not to say they're not generous. Yeah. Don't want to say that. That sounds incorrect. But the habit of giving a sp- specific percentage month, to, you know, every month or every week or whatever has shifted. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. They're, they're very moved towards yeah. need. They're not living out of conviction. Yeah. About how ought I live as a follower of Jesus? <sighs> yeah, that sounds really hard, though, because that sounds like you now have to create, like, almost every week yeah. for tithing some sort of, like, issue <laughs> to compel someone. Yeah. That's, out of co- just, that's just how they enter our doors. Wow. Right? They enter our yeah. doors hardwired to give, to give. them what moves them, yeah. what feels like they should give, and we're trying to shift Interesting. that yeah. Like, this is who we are. This is yeah. what it means to follow Jesus. That's good. So. Yeah. It's crazy because, like, inner city LA, where we are, like, here at Koreatown and all, uh, like, it's like, it almost will cause an internal chuckle. Like, if you're like, growing birds are middle class, well, we ain't middle class. Mm-hmm. So, mm. I mean, because, like, when we look out, like, uh, you know, like, forget, like, the joke, like, oh, this inflation. Like, okay, well, <laughs> the cost of living in inner city LA right now is. SoFi and new yeah. and that, but yeah. it's crazy. A house that my grandmother paid fourteen thousand dollars for is at nine eighty nine. Wow! Uh, in the same neighborhood I grew up, and I was like, "There's not." And I uh, promise you, on everything that's gang and everything, there's no way I would pay that much for this. Yeah, like, yeah. Like you know, and so like that, and then so like uh, people who are probably professionals and would would have hoped like twenty years ago would have been middle class and okay. It's it's a daily struggle, and if they don't have in our community, we're switching to forget dual. We're to we're almost like uh, uh, yeah, right. Families yeah, one domain so they can yeah. survive. Or, or gig economy, right? So yeah. you know you may drive for Uber at the end, you know end of your day, so you've got like two to three incomes, right? You're multi- yeah. And I just I just want to say like I was thinking of everything. I was like I think one thing that we had to pivot from is we had to be have we had to have a we had to create a culture in our church as a uh, a culture of pivot hmm. because a lot of us come into our church we want to have church to be like what we were <laughs> and then it changed and then changed again with COVID and we like our everything that we do has to be totally changed in mind to like okay well we're not going to have tithers now what yeah and so we had to pivot to like okay yeah. how do we find donors or whatever. that's like, right we had to like let's get in here and that was yeah. forced us like to like how do we get around that how do we get yeah uh, like you know like we're doing they're like but we can't look we don't have the like the, the pre-64 person like funding what we want to do so right yeah it forces to a lot of change yeah that, that, and that's a good right. point so the other book before church economics came out mark wrote was a book on disruption basically saying yeah you have to pivot right like these things are coming it's happening and if you don't get comfortable with disruption uh, it's going to be too late, right? And so Mark, uh, in that other uh, book on disruption, talks a lot about, like, you know, that's part of just what we're going to have to, like, live through and figure out um, because it happens, like the iPhone, <laughs> right? I was How old is that now? I don't know, 12 years, 13 years? But, like, it's hard to even imagine what life was before it, right, at this stage because we're on it constantly. And now we're thinking about, like, 
I'm practi practically always having to think about like screen time for my kids. <laughs> like I'm like, what is this thing? Right, but talk about like major, major disruption um, that's constantly happening, um, especially you know in the in the tech industry. So Mark's solution then to like thinking like long term sustainability for a local church, right, or for kind of like innovative uh, churches is really to focus more on like the leadership and the structure. Um, and so Mark's, Mark's uh, focus is to, um, using this three-legged stool analogy is to build three teams. And so Eric, you would know this already, but for those that haven't heard, I think it's worth mentioning bec again, because like, I think it's really true. And if I'm to church plan again, I would do it this way with that structure he's presenting to us. So with the three-legged stool analogy, he's saying three teams uh, to, and structure for long-term sustainable ministry around those three teams. Um, and it's also using a football analogy, right? You've got uh, head coach, you've got offense, you've got defense, special teams. So he's saying, yeah, you need all three and they all need to play well together, but they all have very specific lanes that they focus on, right? A defensive player isn't, you're not going to put them on offense or their goal of what they do with defense isn't going to be the same. They're just trying to stop the points, not get the points, right? So you have these different ways that each team has is focused and, and working on a different goal. So what are the three teams? Well, the first team is going to be the spiritual team. Um, that's the team most of you as pastors run. That's the team you know well. Uh, maybe the team that you've gone to school for or trained in, right? That's the team that's modeling reconciliation. Uh, that's the team that's reflecting the local community, promoting inclusion. That's the team that's led by your senior pastor. Uh, that's a team that's sustained economically by ties and offerings. So it's not to say we're losing uh, that stream of income off of ties and offerings, right? But it's saying that's for the spiritual team, right? To build its system around that. The second team is the spiritual, I mean, sorry, the, the social team. Um, and the social team meets the needs of a specific community, right? So that, that's where you're out there, you know what the community needs, you're developing your team to meet that need. Um, and then you're providing a separate structure for that to happen. Uh, Mark uh, advocates for like an umbrella nonprofit um, to make that possible so that you can then have these different social programs under that umbrella nonprofit. Now this social team, right? So you got spiritual, this is social. The social team led by an executive director, they're going to report to a board of directors and you can have on that board church members so that it's tied to the church still, but it's a separate legal structure. And the reason you're doing a separate legal structure is because you want to be able to apply for grants and donations. <laughs> And if you're funneling all through that through the church, you're going to be very limited on your options. So even for me, as I did the, the social enterprise, the cafe got Rosebud, the coffee shop going. Now I'm working on a nonprofit to expand what we do with the training of the youth in coffee to other sites beyond coffee. So we've got like construction and retail and chocolate and all that. But that now is a separate standalone nonprofit uh, to make that happen. Right. And so now we're we're figuring out how to do that. Uh, Eric's here. He's got some real, real experience on because um, your budget. I don't even know how big it is now, but a lot of experience in that. So uh, you got people, people to talk to. The third team, third team is the financial team, um, and this is a team that's going to focus on leveraging the assets of your community, of your church, uh, in order to generate income. Okay, but generating income in a way that's going to bless people too. Okay, so it's not just income for income's sake, but income so you can create this sustainable economic engine, but you're also having a blessing or an impact. So what might that mean might be, well, if you have a church building, uh, when I was at my church, I mean, I rented it out all the time, you know, and it, very benevolent in that rental, but the rental created some income, right? And that did help us. Um, and you could maybe um, monetize some existing services, uh, some things that you're doing that you just, instead of giving it for free, just put a couple bucks on it. That creates a little bit of an economic engine, keeps you know your budget, other budget down. Um, you're able to source it differently. Um, or maybe it's starting a new business and you've got uh, an entrepreneur in your community, rally around them, get that business going. That can create um, its own economic engine. So now all of that to say, um, yes, right? Ties and offerings for the local church. For that first team, the spiritual team, yes to your grants and donations for the nonprofit for your social team, 
and yes to sustainable income through church economics for your financial team. Okay? So the idea is to build three teams for a long-term sustainable ministry um, as a way to all of the other pieces that you can fit un under that. So pause real quick there. Um, could that approach work for you? How might that work? Um, what would you envision? Anyone try it yet? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Okay, how's it going? Well, I already had the nonprofit. Okay. The church. Yeah. And I read Disruption. Yep. And I thought, this is amazing. Yeah. So they're working together, they're intertwined. Awesome. So the nonprofit is how we connect with a lot of different churches. Yep. We have massive amounts of resources coming into what we're doing as a church plant. Yep. And it never even shows up on our budget. Yeah, awesome. Okay. So, so and then you're working on the coffee side yeah. as your third piece. Yeah. That would be like the business it's piece. Part, yes. yes. Awesome. This isn't like overnight. This takes a while. <laughs> I mean, I, I did for me 10 years at a neighborhood church, and now I don't know how long on the coffee side. I haven't sat down to think about it, but it takes a long time. Um, and the case studies I'm about to show you are one church, 12 years. So again, but we're thinking long term. That's what I'm trying to like say again. This is for the long haul, right? So we got to make some major shifts and they're going to take a while. That's a wonderful example. Anyone else trying this, or how does this sit with you? Three teams. Spiritual, social, financial. Can I say something real quick? Yeah. Um, I think that it may be helpful for everybody just to remember, like, this isn't like a big church thing. Like, oh, you yeah. Have to, you don't have, like, Kurt's Coffee Shop is tiny. It's, like, makeshift. Yeah. It's ha but it's happening. Yeah. Right? If you go to row C, like you walk into there and you think, this is what I have to do? Like, no. <laughs> it's like this amazing, huge yeah. operation. and beautiful. But like that, and that may happen over time. But you can do this with a church of 50. Yes. Right? You're yeah. already doing the, the spiritual part. Like starting a separate nonprofit, let's, I'm just using a, a very common thing to say, like, uh, do a food pantry, right? That's not a religious nonprofit. That's it's something that churches do already all the time, right? Yeah. And then doing basically a side hustle yeah. the church economics part. Like, you can scale it all the way down or all the way up. Yeah. And mine started with a little coffee cart. And a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in time. <laughs> the hustle, right? So I'll say from the yeah. small context, yeah. I wanted that to be our DNA from the beginning, even if we didn't see a lot of growth or progress for a while. Hmm. Like I wanted to get yeah. it set up that way yeah. so that as things grew and people came in, we had places to put them. Yeah. yeah. So that's how we did it that way. Yeah, that's good. So I, I believe in this model. Um, I, I think there's something to it. If I, like I said, if I church plan again, I'm gonna do it around that model. Um, but I also wanted to test it. <laughs> I also wanted to put it to the test. So that's where I went to school. I was like, okay, I'm going to research this, you know, see who's doing it and how it's going. Um, and so um, I want to share here my case studies, um, and, but we'll do a trivia break before I get into those. Um, but I, I'm going to give you quick context on my case studies because uh, this is what I went to go research and figure out. So case studies, meaning like I'm doing like qualitative data. I'm doing interviews. I'm getting the story. I'm talking to the key players and I'm deep diving. Right, this is not quantitative, a bunch of data, all of this, no, nope. I'm just looking at those that have succeeded, succeeded, right, um, in whatever their project was. And for me, because you have to, in your dissertation, get really narrow, uh, I focused on the one asset that a lot of neighborhood churches have, and that's land. And land is sitting there. And land is also long-term. Right, so I was like, okay, I really want to focus on land and what our church is doing with their properties because it's one of our most underutilized assets in the church world. Um, I think, actually, don't quote me on this, but look it up. I think I had read Catholic Church, largest landowner in the world. Catholic Church. And I think the Mormons, I, think, I can't remember what theirs, but they came up on the list too. They, they own a, a lot of land, right? Long term, this is like how you sustain things for a really long time. So I went after churches that redeveloped property for um, this threefold practice, right? So it was a church that's going to have a spiritual team. They're still doing their Sunday. 
Uh, it's a church that's got some sort of social impact and then some sort of financial thing. That's so these three pieces I went to go research. Um, so this one here, South Park, um, quick context on that one. This is Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and this was a uh, United Methodist Church uh, in like the like really kind of affluent suburbs of Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, started in like 1966. Oh, they were sitting on uh, seven acres of land and most of the land was just green space, right? Just kind of like lawn, like just grass. Uh, and they had their church building, traditional United Methodist church building. Um, and they were doing their thing. The whole area of Charlotte like developed around them, um, especially that area. And then they're just this, you know, big seven acres of a church property right there. And uh, they begin to see a steady church decline. And they dropped their, I think their height was probably like 800. And then they were down into like 400. They had lost 50% of their uh, congregation to aging. Uh, so they sat down and had figured out, like, how, what are we going to do? How are we going to sustain ministry over the long haul? What can we do? So they ended up selling. This is how they did it. They sold six of the seven acres. So they held on to one acre. They sold six acres to a developer. The developer came in um, and like a partner, though, developed the local property right around them into a hotel and also mixed use apartments you know, very popular, right? You've got kind of nice uh, luxury apartments with retail space below. So what it allows for, and this is their church, they rebuilt the whole church too. And then you can see like they added on a few things like this, this is their, uh, their church sign. So like on Sunday, it's all of like their, their activities, but then during the week, um, they make $120,000 off just putting someone else's ads up. Um, yeah, just, they do nothing for that, right? They just partner with an agency and they, that gets put up there, right? $120,000. Easy, right? The rest of the, yeah, so it's all surrounded. Um, I wish I had like a bird's eye view of it. Maybe on Google Earth we could see it. But now what's happened is the church is right in the center and surrounded by these apartments, this retail, and this hotel. So, and then they have, you know, what they kept for their church and rebuilt that. So now you can do your wedding, right, in that church. Have your guests stay at the hotel, get their nails done at the retail store, <laughs> and go out for dinner. You know, it's like, okay, small little kind of like micro ecosystem. Really, really cool. Um, then the other one here is actually not too far. That's Garden Grove. Uh, that church, United Methodist Church as well. Um, I'm at a Methodist school, so I was kind of limiting myself there. But um, they, they built uh, four acres, four acres. This was 2015. Same story, declining attendance. They're trying to figure out how to sustain ministry. They, they leased, not sold, leased two acres. Uh, to an affordable housing developer. Affordable, affordable housing developer comes in and builds uh, apartments for seniors. That's the Wesley Village for seniors. And then also for affordable, uh, affordable housing for families. Then they also built a building for Head Start. And that's important because the Head Start preschool program uh, generates a lot of money for them, right? Because they're one of their biggest tenants. Um, but they lease the land um, over to um, the affordable developer. And there is a waiting list for people to live in those places in Garden Grove. Huge impact, right, for that neighborhood. Huge impact because on the backstory, Garden Grove, I don't know, whatever, trying to like keep up with like Disneyland and other stuff, wanted to build out one of its main strips. So they displaced uh, over eminent domain um, families. So when the church came and said, hey, we're willing to rebuild and redevelop and put some housing, they're like, wow, yeah, please, because I have um, a whole list of families that we need to find housing for. And in Garden Grove, it only took them two years to do this project. Two years they had it done because the city was all in on it. Uh, like I was saying earlier, so South Park, Charlotte, 12 years, 12 years to get this massive project done. So, and then um, the top one, that's just me, that's just Rosebud, um, because a lot of like what I've been thinking through is also because of my own experience and trying to figure this out for the long, long haul. And uh, I don't have, um, of the three teams, I have uh, the financial, the nonprofit now, so the social, where I'm now still missing the spiritual. And so I'm here trying to still figure that out, um, but wanted to put that um, in there as part of an example. Awesome. Okay, so coming back here, um, did my case studies. 
This is the insight I received from the research. And I think it can be applied to like kind of in a, any innovative project, right? Don't get locked in, I'm hoping, and just like, hey, I've got church land to redevelop into these and have these three teams on it, right? No, I think these are, um, looking at the three teams, I think if you had just your innovative project in mind, thinking about long-term sustainability, here's some key insights, what I learned, okay? The vision for the project from across the board aligned with narrative from scripture. So everyone had a story from scripture that they told me that was kind of shaping um, the journey uh, or even the reason why they did it. So maybe it was for um, at, in Charlotte, the woman at the well. Um, they wanted to be a place where people um, reconnected in a very natural, easy way. Um, I've used that story myself for the coffee shop. Um, or it was um, <clears throat> like during the journey, because Charlotte, North Carolina took so long, South Park, it took 12 years, they started to narrate around like the Exodus story <laughs> and that journey in the wilderness, right? So they needed this narrative to sustain them. Um, the implementation of the vision, it in, uh, invigorated the faith of the congregants. So they all talked about like, the, as you're going through this innovate, innovative project and you're making this happen, the faith increased in that time. Um, the other thing I learned too is that the pastors uh, grew the most. Uh, but they heavily relied on the church members to make the project happen, right? So if you're thinking about like whatever you're working on and you're like, hey, we want to make this sustainable, that the pastor or whoever your, let's say, head coaches, they, they have a lot to learn because they weren't trained in this. So you really need someone that's open-minded and willing to absorb and take it in. But the key people that really kind of pushed it through were and were relied on the most were the church members. And then spiritual practices, I was really interested in that, like, you know, what spiritual practices, you know, carried you through it. And what carried them the most were the three of gathered worship, small groups, and prayer. So they all had those at the top three of the spiritual practices. So maybe you're thinking about a project you're wanting to work through or something you want to change, disrupt, innovate. Uh, these would be your three I could suggest to rely on the most. So kind of walk through that, that change, that journey into... Um, the new project. And then overall, um, the church attendance did not grow um, after the project concluded. Yeah, so I think that was a really interesting finding because myself, when I was pitching for the coffee shop, and maybe you've had that experience too, we're like, oh, well, if we go do this and we get to meet these people, the church is going to grow as a result. Um, the truth is the church doesn't. Um, <laughs> that means there's another piece of the puzzle here that's got to get filled. Um, I don't know what that is. I can make some guesses, right? Maybe you have to be very intentional about your evangelism and your discipleship, but it's not going to necessitate growth. So you can't, in this is like, okay, well, if we go do that, it's going to lead, like build it and they will come. No, yeah, build it, they will come to whatever that is, <laughs> but that doesn't mean what that is, um, is the same as the church. Um, yeah. So my, this is my best guess. My best guess right now. Say, yeah. No, no, no. But my, I, I can do my, my yeah, my, my best guess right now is it creates the, you, you do, it necessitates and you get out of the project the connection. What you do with that connection needs a lot of intentionality and, and it, it, it can't be assumed the connection is all that it needs. The other thing I would say too is um, the people that you're connecting with have their own churches. They have their own, um, you know, house of worship or their own rhythms. And so just because now you're all of a sudden connected doesn't mean that they want to jump over. Yeah. You know, and so that's something that's not going to necessitate that growth. So I think the overall insight I took away was the Innovator Project will increase the faith of your current congregation but it's not going to necessitate new growth. So you'll now have to figure out, okay, how do we connect the dots? And all of a sudden we have all these people we're interacting with, but now what's next? And it's like I was saying with, with Rose by my cafe, right? Like I've got two teams. I have not figured out the third team yet, the spiritual side. And this is very true for me. It's like, I'm still trying to figure out. I have people come in every single day and we have all sorts of like God encounters. 
and we pray and we talk and we meet and it's awesome, right? But it doesn't then mean people are showing up on a Sunday morning at the local church. So, yeah. Well, I don't know. That's why I just putting in here, it's not going to necessitate new growth for your local church if that's the goal. Yeah, because like one of the reasons why we do microsites. Yes, we you solved it differently. Yeah. What the people we're reaching and yeah. connecting to are even going to come to. Yeah. Culturally speaking. Yeah. 100%. Economically speaking, yeah. they're not going to connect. Yeah. So, but, but see, I, I start with my context of a neighborhood church, right? So that's my mentality of the research. Whereas you have solved it in another way, a local neighborhood church would have to make a major shift to go to microsites, right? Or something like that. But they would have to find another way to solve it. Yeah, um, there does need to be an end to yeah. build the kingdom at yeah. some level. At least if we're doing it integrally yes. from a spiritual perspective. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so the social insights, what I picked up on that team or that side, um, it does for sure, like this, you know, one of your projects or if you're doing something like this, it increases points of intersection with the local community. Um, so in this case, this would be um, the housing over at Garden Grove. Um, and so they now have neighbors that they meet and connect with easily. Um, same when I was over at Charlotte talking to them. And um, this kind of goes against what I was just sharing with you, but the like outlier was I they had a after service reception and i just was asking random people like where do you live and they're like oh i live across the street in the apartment i was like all right that is cool so it can happen but that doesn't mean like they integrated into that local community but it does create intersections and points where people do meet and it builds new bridges for partnerships um and then also like because of the social team is focused on the needs of the community it does bring um, the church in direct contact with the poor and the needy so it, it pulls that all directly together. Um, and it also, it, I found out it opens the door for church members to serve regularly because now these other systems and structures where needs are being met are like in their backyard on their doorstep. Um, and so they have all the opportunities they want. Are, they're right there. Um, and then the other thing that was interesting too is it actually increased, the, this kind of a project increased the opportunity to partner with other churches and other organizations. Um, so if you're like, you know, more regionally minded and like ministry and focus with other churches, the social team will help you uh, find ways to connect with the other churches as well. So what I took away as my overall insight there was an innovative project increases hospitality uh, by bringing the neighbors in need to your door. Uh, but then again, how you serve and what you want to do that takes intentionality. Um, they're going to come to the door. They're going to need help. But now how you integrate into that, it's, it's another step that you would have to figure out uh, as a local church. Yeah. Have you all seen that once folks come into this model, that the church's organizational DNA is kind of re-envisioned? Is that kind of a normal, like, I guess? I didn't practice? see that in, in the case studies. Um, what I found was the, the kind of social model that was happening didn't ne mean didn't also necessitate that the local congregation got involved. Okay. It brought them to the doorstep, but it didn't bring them through the door. Why is it that you think? I know there's a whole nother Oh, sure, yeah. Okay, yeah. So my guess on that is um, you're, it's a generational mindset um, where you like have very hands-off service, um, and people just don't have the time or energy to go serve or decide not to. I think it's a whole generational shift that understands it different. So again, these would be like older congregations that or decline, you know, neighborhood churches, things like that, that have just done it the same way for so long. That even when someone in need is on their doorstep, it doesn't mean they're going to do something. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then the financial insight, almost done here, guys. Oh, hey, we're doing good on time. Yeah. 107. Okay. Uh, financial insights, what I learned, um, it does increase long lasting revenue streams. So they all had new ways to generate funds over the long haul. And it blew like the ceiling off of what was possible financially for the, the local congregation. So like, you know, you kind of had like your operating budget as a church was here when they had finished their projects and then what they did now they, they're like, you know, the ceiling was through the roof on what they was possible. 
It didn't mean that they were generating all that money. It just meant the potential had uh, extremely increased. It was supporting at least half of their operational budgets, um, which I thought was interesting. Have a good one. And then um, <laughs> the final costs um, will surprise you. What happened there is like everyone who started a project had surprise costs come up that they weren't ready for and um, had to deal with having to spend more money than they planned, right? So probably the, the rule of thumb there is like create your startup budget or your budget and then multiply it by two <laughs> because like everyone came across something that was hugely expensive and they had to figure out how to get through that and it was, and it was a big surprise. They had no idea uh, that was coming. And then the other one was must align with like-minded business partners who share the same goals. So none of these uh, case studies were technically successful if they didn't have a business partner who aligned with um, their, their goals and what they were after. So I even like talked to the developers and they talked to me about how important it was they align with the values of the church. And they would not have done it if they didn't. So that vision alignment was critical to make it possible so that they could end up with their project. Um, and then, so I think my overall takeaway on that one was um, it increases the financial potential, but it can only be reached with value aligned business partners. So the only way to get it through is if you find the right people in, in business that align on your vision and your value. Um, otherwise it's gonna come to a halt and you won't get through, yeah. Because they, like in the Charlotte one, they had like lean issues pop up, um, but the developer was willing to find some alternative ways to work around it. I mean, they almost shut the whole project down because one historic family owned like a sidewalk somehow or like a strip of land. And so they, and it was in the lease that it could only be used for something and, or like in the title. Anyway, the developer had to like step in, buy that portion, sell it back. I mean, just do some weird stuff, right? And they, no one would have done that if they weren't all aligned. So one word of advice that I also heard was everyone said, work with professionals. They all said, don't, don't do something on your own. Even if you have like professional, let's say church members, um, they all said, the only thing I said, what, what advice would you give? They all said, you have to work with professionals. Um, you know, outside the church, not just inside the church, right? Not, but the outside professional, right? So you have to find your, like, you know, your, your attorney or um, developer, you know, all of that needs to be done with these professionals outside, not trying to do it all in-house. That was their, their main takeaway. So I thought that, oh, that's really interesting. So here's what I'll leave you with. Um, taking all of that insight, what I've learned so far is, you know, if you're looking at long-term sustainability off of the three teams, uh, you know, build that by pursuing your innovative projects to that will so you can invigorate your faith, increase your social intersections, and expand your financial potential. That to me feels like a true statement from what I picked up. Um, and then what you guys do with that, I don't know, but like that feels like that, that's solid. Um, it, th that's what will increase um, without, and then kind of like cutting out the other stuff that we hope may happen, didn't happen. <laughs> but I think that's, that's the truth there. Well, that's all I have for you guys. It, any questions or anything you want me to? Otherwise, I'm good to go. Yeah. Have you seen particular assessments that really help with um, the type of wiring that the three team members that are spearheading those elements need and that interplay together well? Yeah, the, the, um, the Bobby Beal assessment, team assessment, and that, that's B-I-E-H-L. Yeah, and that's gonna be like looking at, um, you know, the type of personalities where you've got like a, a developer, or you've got maybe someone that's like manager, manager yeah, in, innovative, like someone that's always just dreaming, designing. So, but that one will give you like, so you kind of know how to structure your teams off of that one, it's a team structure. B uh, B I E H L. Yeah, That's good. and it's a very like you know quick, simple assessment that will help you uh, pull the right team together. I don't know if it's I don't know if it's as specific to that one, but Patrick Lencioni came out with Working Genius. Oh, okay. That's about teams. Yeah, awesome. Like the six like core 
core elements of the process. Of doing is it an assessment too? Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Quick. It's quick. Uh, it's really, really good. Working yeah, more genius. Yeah, and he's written a lot on management. Yeah. Yeah, sounds very similar to Beals then. Yeah, yeah. I have That's a question good. on the spiritual development side. Yeah. Because a lot of the examples were about financial sustainability. Yes. Connecting with community. Yeah. So what would you say, is there anything you could say that you learned in your study mm -hmm. specifically to making more disciples that make more disciples? Like what, how did the three part process Mm -hmm. contribute or help or have an impact? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I would say I didn't, I didn't hear much or receive much on the disciple making disciples. Um, I think what I came to the conclusion was um, these external things are really critical for what needs to happen internally, but they can't replace that. Right, and I think that's kind of where you've got to make some really like wise decisions. Is like you can create these external systems and structures that will sustain, but that doesn't mean what happens internally is going to turn into disciples making disciples. Um, that is still something that has to happen under the right leadership, but it will give you the space to do that without having to be all burdened and worried and stressed where the next paycheck's coming from. So you know, it's kind of a little bit of a, of, you know, yeah. Because otherwise you can be running and running and running on the hamster wheel, even with discipleship making, but not making ends meet financially, sure. you know, and so then that will burn it out too. Would you say though, uh, like Mark DeMoss, what's this church called, Mosaic? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do, do they, because if they would be a case study, would they have something to say about disciples making disciples as far as? Uh, so I would say, yeah, but their focus in that is on the multicultural movement. So their discipleship that they produce and reproduce is um, uh, multicultural congregations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that, we just got back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so I think what I learned is that their systems are what do that, help facilitate that well. And then having the right leaders. Yeah. We sat through everything from a, a pastoral meeting to a operation meeting to a financial meeting to a next steps meeting. Like we saw it all, and I would say that that's what I. Would say. That's good. Their systems yeah. help that, and then their people. One thing I came back super envious of them yeah. is that they have such seasoned, long-term, committed people in yeah. the community. Yeah. It's so natural yeah. and organic yeah. for them. Like, yeah. They want to be there. They want to make disciples. They're not looking for a check. Exactly. That's a, another way to put it. But yeah. then God brings the, the resources yeah. anyways because they're faithful to the process. He says, like, I've never even read the books, to be quite honest. Oh, okay. Okay. But he did drill in, like, the three Ps. Oh, okay. Yeah. Persistence, patience, and uh, I forget the other one. Oh. And then he was talking about the Ws, too, three Ws, and I even forget them, but like the type of people the that first you're bringing passion, passion. You is these cats that you're bringing in to, to be committed to that have to be willing to work. That was one of the dose. Mm -hmm. It's like, you got to be willing to work mm -hmm. and discipleship, you know, yeah. Work, you know? yeah. So that's, that's what yeah. I walked away with. We that's spent good. four days out there. Right. And so it was cool seeing all that. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did any of the kind of redevelopment communities that you steps in the direction of meeting needs in the community and maybe even a step towards what Kurt's talking about where you can foster some of the engagement and services toward the community with the spaces you redevelop? They all had ministries to like serve the needs of the people in the community already. They were, those were all well established yeah. and they all continued. Um, but none of them had spun them off into nonprofits. Okay, so like yeah. What Mark is advocating for with, uh, with creating nonprofits for the social element, there weren't any that had kind of thread that needle. Yeah. Okay. Other than mine. Yeah. Is that yeah. pretty hard to find then across the country? Like, is this kind of there still? The three part? Oh, yeah. I think it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I had to focus on, like, I went to the property development because I think it's like, 
land is the longest lasting asset a church has. So sure. that's why I wanted to focus that. Um, but I, but even that was hard to find with the three. I, I looked at so many different churches, but they all had like maybe one or two elements, right? But the three together, this is where like the only two I found. No. Yeah, there's not many. Yeah. Devin, you guys, I mean, honestly, Eric is like yeah. a wealth of knowledge with the nonprofit side mm-hmm. in terms of, and like, he's already doing a lot of this stuff. Um, I would just take this mm-hmm. right. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, we can get you some contacts, contacts through uh, Mosaics for their nonprofits. Yeah. They have some great people. Yeah. Because our church is just so, we're poor. Like we're so many people that are taking yeah. debt on actively as they're in our area mm. for their education, for their PhD, for whatever. Wow. But they have so much talent. Yeah. Here at UCLA, yeah. That being able to start a nonprofit with social services that are serving people for like you're saying you know charge them 20 bucks for something yeah um and we also have very wealthy people in the area yes. that are paying 150 dollars an hour to some personal trainer for their yeah. seven-year-old to become the next Ronaldo. yeah man well let's let's charge him 50 bucks an hour mm-hmm. and have the guy who's great on his high school <laughs> soccer team uh, training them yeah something like that is what i'm trying to kick around no that's good well you've got so much innovation happening coming out of ucla too yes. yeah yeah, that's the Silicon Beach area. Yeah. So maybe you can find someone who want to do a tech company. Uh, but cool. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks cool. for having me. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.